All right, cool. I guess it's about time to get started. Can everyone hear me okay? That's usually not a, never a problem. Okay, cool. Wow, this is actually pretty full house for 5 p.m. I'm, uh, I'm impressed, so <laughs> good job, everyone. Um, hope you're enjoying uh, DrupalCon Austin. Um, I'm, this is pretty exciting for me because uh, the last few years I've lived in Austin, so this is a, finally one on the home turf. Uh, if you're here to talk about automated front-end testing, you have found the correct room. If not, I'm sure there's something else interesting uh, for you to roam the halls and find, but that's what we're going to talk about here. Uh, I had a talk at um, uh, DrupalCon Prague called uh, Front-end Ops, and it was just the process of automating front-end stuff in general. And at the bottom, I had called it, or how to automate the process of breaking things. Um, so this is uh, the how to automate the process of detecting when you break all the things. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, cool. This is all working good. I am Chris Rupel. I'm a front-end developer at Four Kitchens. Uh, uh, Four Kitchens is based in Austin, Texas here. Uh, but I live in Germany um, right now. So I just moved a couple months ago, but I work remotely for them. And if you're looking for a cool company that... Uh, you want to work for, and you're not necessarily living in Austin, uh, we are hiring. Uh, there's a link underneath this logo at the bottom. Uh, the slides are online um, on the session description already, so you can get them there. Oh, fun. There we go. Uh, so some of the things I do, uh, in addition to, to working and building things for clients, um, I like contributing and presenting about open source in general, um, not just Drupal. Uh, I have this uh, cool talk about CSS uh, transforms in there if you want to look at uh, 3D in the browser. Um, I maintain the modernizer module for Drupal. Uh, I contributed heavily to the fast click Drupal module to like get rid of that tap delay on all your mobile sites, go download it. Um, and we're working on a, a pre-render and prefetch module for Drupal to, uh, to do some like speculative rendering in the browser, which is neat. Um, I also posted a, a Jekyll schedule thing. Um, if you if you build Jekyll sites, I know that's borderline heresy here, but um, I've already gotten enough uh, uh, grief for it, so I don't mind talking about it. Deckle. Yeah, Deckle's cool too. Yeah, uh, check it out. Deckle with a D. Um, Amitai from uh, Gizra, I think the name is, uh, built it. Anyway. Uh, so the differences from server-side testing, we're going to talk about testing the front end. Um, that front end uh, might be Drupal, it might be something, uh, a layer that sits in front of Drupal. At Four Kitchens we do a lot of work with decoupled systems and we'll build like a node front end that serves the website, but Drupal is the content management system behind it. Uh, so uh, all these things that happen on server-side testing have to happen in a way on front end too. So if you're familiar with server-side testing, a lot of this won't be new to you. Um, the front end, however, is very different from the back end. You know, you're talking about one server that serves up pages to many browsers. Now, in this case, we're talking about testing the many browsers that are connecting to one server. Um, so you've got many environments to test, uh, and there's a lot more fuzziness involved. Uh, often on the server, you'll get a 500, you get a, uh, you know, a, a a stack trace from XHProf or something like that. Um, and then on the front end, you don't exactly have that. You have your JavaScript console, but there are a lot of things that we, we humans consider errors that a machine cannot consider an error. Um, there are minor CSS changes that throw the layout off. Uh, changes to JavaScript files that like during the build step, it gets broken somewhere along there just because you forgot a semicolon at the end of one file. Uh, or maybe your aggregates are changing when they shouldn't be because, or have you ever looked at the Drupal aggregates? There's like that one little C tools aggregate. It drives me nuts. And, um, you know, it should just be like piled in with everything else. And so you, sometimes you want to monitor if those things are creeping back into your, to, to your site. Um, uh, there's also like bigger performance regressions. Um, maybe, uh, oh, I'll have an example later, but, you know, you might upload content that changes uh, the website and, and causes a regression. It's not just like a development mistake. So the front end uh, development uh, trade is becoming more matured and we need better tools to help us uh, check all of these things because people rely on the front end 
uh, to do a whole lot more than they used to. Um, it's not just you know center tags and, and marquee anymore. Um, so we need the same testing abilities that are have been promoted and uh, tested and 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 tried on the back end for for many years. Um, we need to be able to test page load times. We need to test the render speed of the browser. Um, uh, if you're developing a site that has a, a performance budget, you need to actually stick to that performance budget. Um, you might want to verify that visual changes have occurred or perhaps verify that visual changes have not occurred um, in, in other places on the website. Uh, sometimes you want accountability for code changes. Um, and uh, uh, so there's lots of things on the front end uh, that, that we need to pay attention to and, and you know, you can't just, uh, uh, react to it. You want to be proactive and, and you want to work towards this goal with it in mind uh, in the beginning. So um, I want to talk about altering our workflow a little bit here um, and show you lots of tools that can be used by teams uh, to help facilitate this change and to facilitate you know more reliable uh, uh, development. Uh, so there's a, a, a quote by Ilya Grigoric of Google. He's a web performance engineer and he's um, amazing. Uh, his, he said, performance is not a checklist, it's a continuous process. So um, you can't just think about it at the end. Um, a lot of my job has to do with front end performance, so there's gonna be a bunch of those tools in the second half. Uh, but, uh, and while there are things you can do to fix it after everything else has been done, you know, sometimes uh, it, can't, it can't quite be fixed the same way as if you'd been thinking about it all along and had kind of baked in the performance requirement to that, that feature that took, you know, three or four sprints to build. Another one is uh, don't take measures without measuring them. So you often see a lot of uh, best practices thrown around on the web, and I am not a believer in that term. Um, there are good practices, but there are... Uh, the web moves too fast for best practices to stick around for very long. So uh, test, 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 and test again, and get some data and measure it, and then do something about your measurements. So uh, that's the, if you took away nothing from this, this uh, whole talk, that's uh, the most important thing. Um, so yes, uh, these slides and the code are on GitHub. They're open source, uh, as with all respectable code. Um, and you may take any of the examples from the slides and use them for any purpose, commercial or not, uh, you are free to do that, and I would be delighted if you did. And if you find a problem with them or have an improvement to make to them, I would also be delighted if you contributed it back on GitHub. That makes everyone uh, have you know, a better set of tools. So, um, and like I said, you can go to my uh, DrupalCon session page. There's a link to the slides already up there. Um, feel free to, to follow along on your computer or try out these code samples for yourself. Uh, the Wi-Fi here is actually pretty smoking, so um, I'm uh, optimistic about all these being impressive up here. So functional testing. Functional testing is the act of uh, making sure that a piece of, uh, uh, like a feature on your website actually functions. Um, there are various levels of this, uh, but most of the time, I think we're all familiar with the concept of QA. So. You might have to do it yourself. You might have a dedicated individual on your team. You might have an entire department within your organization that handles QA, uh, so the quality assurance of, of the, the work that you're building. Um, and this involves making a human sit down, load the website, follow a set of steps, and uh, repeat this process over and over as a feature is built. And you might add more steps to that, but a human is still doing that. Um, uh, browser technology has come a long way and we now have uh, really awesome tools that can reliably do this for us. So you can script the process of functional testing um, in many, many, many cases. Um, it's not a silver bullet, and you may still need a human to look at a lot of things, but um, for many basic tests, uh, we have tools to do it. Uh, so enter Casper.js. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, Casper.js is a tool built on top of PhantomJS. Um, I try to put a warning in my slides. I'm not gonna cover every tool that goes down. Uh, it'd be, it, I couldn't get to the bottom of this if I described every tool that we're building on top of here. But uh, PhantomJS, just to give you a one, like an elevator pitch, is a uh, headless web kit 
And what it does is it does everything that WebKit does when you load a web page, like Chrome from a year ago or older, or Safari. Um, that is the WebKit rendering engine. And you can, uh, using PhantomJS, you can script uh, actions in WebKit. And you can do all sorts of things, anything that a human can do, and really more. Um, so you could run the same test. Uh, you could run a script to check for the conditions on a web page at multiple screen sizes. Um, you can test multiple, uh, you can test complex features or navigation paths on your website. Um, you can test for the absence or uh, existence of a particular element. And uh, you can count things. You can do anything pretty much that you can do with JavaScript, you can do with Phantom, because it's written in JavaScript. Uh, so again, you can even like log in to your Drupal site and automate complex actions. Oh, awesome. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to do these on the console, so I'm not even going to bother resizing this. But uh, we're going to run two Casper tests here, and I'm going to show you how uh, they work. So um, I will jump over to Sublime here and actually uh, show you these tests. Because uh, one thing that when you look around on the web, you don't exactly see any uh, scripts that are fully commented. So I wanted to give uh, some material here that has everything explained within the file. You don't need a blog post to go along with this thing. You can read, there's uh, links to every single API call. But what Casper does in this script, uh, how, how many people are familiar with picture fill? I'm sorry. So let's just get a sh show of hands, all right. Ooh, uh, I'd actually like to see more because the picture element is going to be native in the next version of Chrome, so uh, beware. Um, so picture fill is, is a piece of JavaScript that simulates the picture element. Um, and what this means is that you can embed responsive images into your browser or into the web page. Um, this will be native functionality um, in some browsers very soon, but it, in the case that it isn't, this is what the polyfill is for. But we need to make sure the picture fill operates correctly when we build a website. Um, I have built responsive images many times on a site, and we'd write some code, write some code, and then you know maybe a, a few days later someone says, hey, the responsive image is broke, and you need to fix it. And I'm like, no, I don't think it, I don't think it broke. I never do anything wrong. Um, and so then you got to have like a discussion about that, right? Well, there's no need for a discussion because we can test this all the time. Um, and so you can write a script that does this. So what happens here is that um, I'm going to run five tests on the picture fill. That's what this five here stands for. Um, and you'll see that you can go through here, and it opens a URL. Um, it, it, it checks for the existence of an element, so it asserts that there is a picture element on the page. Um, this string is a, a like a jQuery selector, you know. Um, and then we can make sure that there are three source tags, so that uh, you know if you ran this test without checking to make sure that the things you needed were there, then it's not such a good test. Um, there might be something else wrong. So this is again a selector that looks for three source tags inside of a picture. Um, and then we uh, resize the viewport. Uh, then we'll go along and look for uh, inside picture. We're going to look for an image tag that actually has a, an attribute of medium.jpg. Um, and so if we don't find that, then the test, um, the picture fill is not showing the correct image at this viewport. Uh, we'll resize two times more, and then uh, the same thing will happen. So I'm going to jump over here and go to uh, this example, and I'm going to say Casper, whoop, Casper. So I'm going to run this, and it's not going to take long because our Wi-Fi is awesome here. Great. So that happened before I could even finish my sentence about the great Wi-Fi. Um, so you see that it says testing picture fill. It says pass. The picture element was found. Pass. There were three elements inside the picture uh, called source. And then it found medium. It resized to 960 by 640. It found large. And then it uh, resized to 1280 by 1024. And it found the extra large JPEG. Um, so that is... Uh, uh, that's basically all it's doing. This is a pretty simple test, but it allows you to verify that this script is doing what it says it's doing on the page. Um, and uh, even if you implemented responsive images at the beginning of your project, and then four weeks later someone, you know, came and accidentally uh, 
included some code that broke your JavaScript aggregate and it didn't execute all the way, well, instead of finding out after you've merged the code, um, you'll find out immediately because you can have someone run these tests uh, before they um, uh, before they end up merging the code into your code base. So it's pretty cool in my opinion. Um, and this is just front end. So uh, this is just this could be used on a static website. This could be used on you know anything at all. Uh, pick your CMS. So um, that's basically a, a sample script, um, and that's testing the functionality of picture fill. Uh, so this this test was successful. Uh, oh yeah, the next one is Drupal. So. Um, uh, we're going to run a Drupal test now. So we're going to run Casper JS test Drupal JS. Um, and this one, actually, I'll show you the code real fast. So this one's a little bigger, but um, there's this website that I, I just used. It's a demo open source cms.com slash Drupal. You can go to it and like mess around and it'll reset every 30 minutes. Um, it publishes the uh, username and password, so I took it. And then um, I've got this sample node that I'm going to post to the Drupal site. So uh, the title is going to be Hello World, and the content is going to be This content was added by Casper.js. Um, uh, testing doesn't have to be creative, it just has to be functional, right? Um, so it's going to test the Drupal site. There are eight tests in total that this one is going to run. Um, and you can fill in forms with Casper as well. That's what this particular uh, line of code does here. And you can store uh, the form uh, username and password are passed into this form. Um, you can run comments just so when your functional test uh, executes a step that might take uh, longer than you're expecting or longer than instantaneous, you can issue a comment uh, in the log that says, hey, this is what I'm doing. So if you sit there and it you know, hangs for four seconds, you'll be like, oh, it's logging in. Cool. Um, and then uh, we're, we can do some crazy stuff too. You can check the HTTP status. Um, and you can check, this is checking 200. 200 is the status that occurred whenever you see a web page and nothing went wrong. So 200 is the one that we always want to see. Um, you could also explicitly test for a 404 or a 403 um, or a 301 if you want to uh, make sure that your uh, redirect module is working correctly. Um, you could even test for a 500 um, if you've got a page that deliberately breaks uh, your site in some way. Um, and then we uh, look for this uh, logged in class that we're all uh, so familiar with when we are working with Drupal sites. Um, we go ahead and click a link to see the content list. Uh, the overlay will be enabled. And so um, then we are going to go and check and see that the title changed. And also we are going to assert that the path changed um, in accordance with how overlay is supposed to work. We will then again click another link and go to the node add page page. And then we will add a basic page. We will uh, go ahead and make sure that loaded correctly, fill the form with the content that we looked at at the top of the file. And then we will say that we're saving a new node because once again, this might take a moment. Uh, and then we check and make sure that the title matches uh, a regex of the title that we submitted. Um, and then also we would uh, check and make sure that that node contents that I uh, showed you at the top of the file um, actually matches. So, uh, and then um, there's this little block at every bottom of every Casper test that just makes it actually run. Um, so I'm going to go back here. I'm going to hit enter. This Drupal isn't in front of Varnish. So. Oh, awesome. Fail. Well, there you go. Sometimes your tests fail. That's not a big deal. Hmm, I don't know. But when your tests fail, it tells you how to do that. Um, I'm not uh, stressed out enough over this test to like actually make it work in front of you guys. That's not the point of the exercise. But uh, sometimes when you uh, actually get uh, a failure, you know, you're going to see, hey, something's wrong. Um, sometimes it'll be your test, and that might be what's happening here. Um, I ran this five minutes before the presentation, and it worked. Who knows? Um, yeah, it could be a network issue, but uh, uh, I don't 
I don't think it is because the other one was using the network as well. But uh, still, um, you can go ahead and look at this and you can probably run it on your local and maybe someone will have more success than me. Um, but uh, you have an incredible set of tools at your disposal with Casper to do all sorts of things. Anything that you would ask someone to go and click around on the website and verify, you can probably verify with Casper. So we'll give it one more try and see if, uh, see if it works this time. Um, does anybody have any questions in general about, about Casper? Cool. Um, if you have a question, actually, could I ask you to come up and talk into this microphone real fast? Look at that. It worked this time. Yeah, does, uh, does Casper allow you to record tests at all, or do you actually just have to write out the script? Um, at, at this time, I'm pretty sure you have to uh, write your tests yourself. Um, uh, you might be referring to like Selenium has a, uh, an option where um, you can uh, use Firefox and, and it will make a macro out of something that you do on the website and it will record the clicks that a human makes. Um, that is an option and there are other tools to do that. Uh, I don't believe that Casper does that. Thank you. Yes. How time consuming do you find it to be to write all these tests? Um, not very time consuming at all. Uh, if you are an intermediate jQuery person who actually writes jQuery code, you can do this. So um, if you just like install a jQuery plugin and you like run the init script, that's not what I'm talking about. You have to write code. But uh, if you're familiar with JavaScript enough to write your own code, uh, then you can probably write JavaScript to test your code, which is awesome. Um, and uh, Casper can do uh, also, it can do unit tests, so you can just mock an object from the page and, and take it and like make sure that your library is functioning correctly if you wrote one too. So uh, if you got a question, I, I would ask you to step back there. Thank you. Yeah, no, not a problem. Um, I'm gonna look at the demo, yep. All right, so I'm gonna go to node one. I assume that I'm the only one messing with this thing. Yep, so here you go. Uh, this says, hello world, and it says this content was added by Casper.js. So this was the node that I published in that successful run. So that's kind of how it works. It said it was logging in and adding the node and all of that. So you got proof that it actually did what it did. So cool. Uh, next question. Similar to the first one, is there actually a way to capture what happened uh, visually during during the test? Yes, there is. Um, Phantom can do that and there are, um, uh, as I mentioned before, I, I can't go into the uh, extreme details of, of, of how Phantom works, but I do have a slide deck on this DrupalCon uh, session uh, for a past session that uh, details how to do that uh, in quite in great detail. That's what detailing is. Uh. <laughs> so is this uh, doing the same thing Selenium would be doing? Would you be using Casper instead of Selenium? That's correct. You okay. would use Casper instead of Selenium or possibly in addition to. I'm not really sure. If you have one in your infrastructure, it's probably easier just to have one. But, um, and I know that Selenium's made great leaps and bounds. Actually, the last time I used it was quite a while ago and, and I was not, it wasn't in JavaScript, so. Uh, uh, I hear that that's how it works now too. So this is just another option um, that is similar to Selenium. Cool, and I have a second part too. Um, I noticed git element by ID, but you just mentioned that it can use jQuery, so. Uh, well, there's a catch also. Um, uh, when I likened it to jQuery, I said it's about as hard as jQuery. And um, you can uh, use jQuery in your scripts so you can see here that this says return jQuery node page dot content p. Um, I can do this, and I made a note about it in the, the comment here, um, that since you're testing a Drupal site, and I know that Drupal 7 comes with jQuery 144 at a minimum, I can reliably write my test to just use jQuery without checking to see if it's there. Um, and that's just how Drupal works, and so we can make that assumption. Um, if the page does not include jQuery, you can't use jQuery. It will say that that variable is undefined. Um, so you can read more about the uh, assert eval equals 
this function at the at the API doc at the docs here. Um, but this line of code is being run in the 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 uh, environment that Casper created. So this line of code 169 in this file is actually running on the Drupal site. It's not running in the Casper instance. So. So you don't provide jQuery as part of your test. It has to be in one of your testing. Uh, you could um, you could inject it into the page. Uh, you could do that. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't because mm -hmm. it's not there, and it might you know. Sure. You're going to cause some uncertainty there. But if you have jQuery on your page already, feel free to use it. Um, if you were uh, testing a um, Ember app or something like that, you can make Ember calls and uh, go ahead and, and use them as if you were. Uh, typing things into the JavaScript console of, of the web browser of the fully loaded app. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. So we have a need to test chat a lot of times. Is it possible to fire up two different browsers and have them interact to test the you know JavaScript interaction of a chat program? You, you really need like Chrome and Firefox to oh, get fired up. Oh, uh, that's that's interesting. Um, well, I got to be honest. I don't have any experience running multiple instances inside one Casper test. I'd have to look it up. Um, can you can you choose which browser it uses or uh, Casper? Oh, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, it's not Slimer. No. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Actually, it does say that it uh, supports Slimer right here. So um, you can run uh, Slimer is a not quite headless. Uh, uh, it's basically the Firefox version of, of Phantom JS. Um, they're not quite headless yet, but yet, but they are um, aiming for feature parity. So um, maybe it would be possible. Uh, that sounds like a gnarly test. It sounds kind of awesome. So okay. um, yeah, All right, thank uh, you. that's something to shoot for. <laughs> okay, cool. No more questions. Um, awesome. So that was functional testing. Where how am I doing? Uh, so for performance testing, um, like I said, this is a huge chunk of my job at Four Kitchens, and I really enjoy doing it. Um, uh, I, nothing makes me happier than you know getting to look at something that someone else built and telling them how they could do it better, right? Uh, uh, so when you talk about page performance, there are many, many contexts of this, but the one that is pretty most important. Um, is page load time testing. So how fast did the page load? How soon did the user start seeing the web page? Because um, if it uh, takes too long, then the user's going to get bored. They might hit back. They'll go to another link. We all know that story. So um, there are a bunch of tools. And I'm going to go over a couple here. Uh, some of these you would use either or. You might even use a couple of them on top of each other. And I'll try to make note of that. Um, uh, but the first one here is a, a, a way to run automated page speed tests. So Google Page Speed is a tool that uh, analyzes your website and it checks all these different variables and uh, gives you basically, it boils it down into a single number which you can aim for. And so you might say um, as part of your uh, development goals, you'd say we want to launch this with you know an 80 of a, a page speed score of 80. Uh, that's um, uh, just you know, a way to make sure that overall the page is going to load fairly fast, um, and so they call that a speed index. Um, so before you can automate page speed, you'll have to log into code.google.com and get an API key, but they're free, um, and they don't have any uh, like you're not going to run into the limit. Um, uh, they do have a way to pay if you want to set this up for like thousands of instances or something like that. Um, but uh, basically, you can get this for free and get running pretty quick. So Grunt uh, page speed, um, and again, I'm not going to explain exactly what Grunt is, but basically, it'll run tasks for you, many tasks all in a row. Um, and instead of doing it on a web page like Casper did it, Grunt does that as if it was your command line user. So um, instead of you saying, you know, I want to minify my JavaScript and move it into the, the you know, aggregates folder, it can do all that every time you save your file. Um, and so uh, grunt is something that you could run and like, uh, you wouldn't want to do this on file save, but uh, perhaps before you commit your work, you could have it run a little grunt page speed test and see how your remote instance is uh, doing. 
So um, I'm going to jump back over to the console here and run this and give you a demo. Uh, so I'm going to run grunt because I set the default task up just to do this for us. Um, and this is going to test gruntjs.com in the desktop uh, uh, context. Uh, the screen's just a little too small to make this pretty, isn't it? Um, so, oh, you know what I can do? I think I can just, yep. I think this will work better. Oh, nope, whatever. Um, so that one happened really quick because uh, Google caches these responses for about 30 seconds. Um, but basically, you can see here that uh, when uh, I, I ran the page speed desktop task, which is just the default one that I set up in the grunt file, um, and so it goes to gruntjs.com. Uh, the strategy here is something that Google defined. I did not define this. So they have desktop and mobile, and that's it. Um, and so it gave us a score of 91. So that's pretty hot. Uh, the number of resources is 30. It shows you, it says that there's a six hosts that served all the files. That's probably due to a CDN. Um, it tells you how many bytes were downloaded and how many resources were static uh, versus like, you know, a PHP script that returns dynamic content. Um, how many bytes were in the responses and all this. So it gives you a lot of good data. Um, just kind of, this is bird's eye view data. Um, and another cool section that page three re returns here that I can't quite figure out how to surface in the actual web interface. There is a web interface for this. Um, these set, this set of numbers um, is a uh, set of numbers that are just relative to each other. And uh, what it means is that you're, it's the bang for your buck value. So in here, we've only got two numbers that are non-zero. Um, there is a six that tells you to minimize something. And uh, then there's an optimized image, which just means compress the images that are on the page. Uh, the minimize render blocking resources issue is a 6, and the other one is a 1.5. So uh, it is approximately, using simple math here, uh, um, uh, 1.5 goes into 6 about four times. So well, this number goes in about four times. So it's going to be about four times as effective to fix that other problem than it will be to fix the, the images problem. Um, and I've had uh, runs of this thing where I saw like 30 on the thing. So you get a 30x uh, gain, performance gain, from fixing that problem versus fixing another problem. So it can help you prioritize issues uh, just at a, at a bird's eye thing. And, and this is built by Google. Like I said, they have a, they have a, a, um, a, an Apache thing. I'm front end. I don't know. It's called mod page speed. And wherever you put mod rewrite, you put mod page speed. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I need I need my I need my IT up here. Matt's laughing at me. Um, so uh, basically, they will uh, they have a little Apache extension that will uh, essentially do a lot of this stuff for you. And it'll even if you have a static website that doesn't have combined and minified assets, it'll it'll do that on the back end and just kind of like spit it out for you, which is pretty cool. Um, there are a couple issues with Drupal sites. I know uh, Theodore Viadala, he is, uh, well, never mind. He's uh, formerly of Acquia. Uh, he had uh, tried this out and uh, wanted to evaluate it for, you know, their use. And um, he found a couple issues with it. But still, uh, it's a great tool and um, um, solves a lot of these problems, like, out of the box sometimes. Um, so I'm going to do one more here um, uh, with this grunt page speed mobile. Um, so the colon just means it's like a subtask in, in grunt. So the first one's desktop, this one's mobile. Um, you'll notice something different about this one. Um, it looks meaner. <laughs> so uh, um, just in case people cannot see the difference between green and red, uh, the first one was green and it signified that the score was higher than the threshold that I set. Um, and this one is lower. So we had set a threshold of 85. The first score was 91. And this score is 79. Um, so it fell below our threshold, and this is a fail, right? Um, and, and, and all you're doing is you're, you're meeting your own goal in this case. But still, the same set of data is there. But you'll notice that in this one, 
there are a lot more numbers that uh, can be fixed. So uh, relative to whatever the one is going to be here, uh, the configuring the viewport needs to be done. Um, maybe this isn't a responsive site. I don't know. There are 24 assets, or no, there are not 24 assets. Excuse me. There are assets that are blocking the render pipeline in the browser, and fixing those problems would be 24 times as effective, or maybe 2.4 times as effective as that 10 above. Um, it's going to be, well, now this is crazy math, but like it's going to be 16 times as effective as this optimized image thing. Um, so uh, all these have uh, this, this index here, and you can look at these problems. And uh, you, was, you basically want to tackle them, uh, tackle the one with the biggest number first, go to the next biggest number, and so forth. Um, and so then it gives you this, uh, this uh, error at the bottom. Um, so that's front page speed. Um, and, and like I said, it's built on page speed, and you have to kind of figure out the ins and outs of grunt. But I do have a slide deck up there to help you get through all of those things if, if you're not familiar with them. So we don't need this anymore. The next tool is probably my favorite. It's Fantomas. Um, so this is Phantom JS based, and it's a web performance metrics tool. Uh, that's a mouthful, but basically what it does is it provides a different uh, facet of of, uh, of metrics here. So it gives you a lot more data. It exposes a lot more data than than PageSpeed does. So um, PageSpeed is kind of uh, for um, they 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 have links that go to all these help pages on their uh, website, but this one gives you a lot more raw data. So there's a huge use, usage guide, and you should check it out. Um, so I'm just going to couple run a couple basic reports here and show you uh, what it looks like. Um, so Fontomas. So I'm going to run this, and it's going to take a second because it has to <laughs> fetch the web page. All right, it has to fetch the web page and um, go and run all these analytics on it, but it does have to wait and request all the resources. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, one of the coolest things about Mod PageSpeed is that it's actually run remotely off of their servers. So you do have to have an internet connection to use it, but it's not based, the, the score is not based on your uh, connection that you currently have, as are some of these tools. Uh, so if you have bad Wi-Fi, it'll affect the performance of this tool, but it won't perfect, affect the performance of page speed. It won't change the di results. Um, so here we got a lot back. Um, I'm not going to go through all this. I would, we'd be here till you know 8:30. But uh, uh, it'll tell you the number of requests, and it'll tell you like all this data about it. You can see time to first and last byte, the uh, amount of HTML that came down whether or not there were AJAX requests and how many HTML files were loaded. If you have ads, this number is going to be astronomical. Um, the uh, amount of the number and the size of all your aggregates and all sorts of cool stuff like that. So uh, it's, it tells you how many jQuery sizzle calls were in there and it has like all this special integration. Um, it's very, very cool. Uh, and so it, then it tells you of these things that were there, it tells you like the worst ones, right? So. Actually, you can run this, and, and I was practicing for my slides, and I found a, a kind of a minor issue, but I found an issue with our website. And so I was like, oh, cool. Um, you know, we're serving from, like, a dev domain on accident. And, um, uh, you know, I, I filed an issue and found it. But, you know, a manual inspection would have taken a really long time to find that kind of thing because it was actually behind a redirect. So, um, but Fontmas just tells it all to you. Uh, so we're going to run that again. Um, let's see if I can do this without looking. No, I can't. Viewport. Yep, okay. Viewport uh, equals 320 by 480 and film strip, which someone was asking about, uh, uh, can we take screenshots earlier? Wow. Did that? Uh, film. We'll just open one. No, that one's going to be boring. Uh, 16. So uh, actually, here, I got a better idea. Um, so it ran the same data here, and the, the test was basically the same as before, but I actually specified a viewport this time. So, and then we can look, and I'm just using the OS X preview here, but it took screenshots at each successive. See, the, there's no images in this one. Now there are some images. Finally, that little ad thing in the left sidebar loaded. 
So it takes a little film strip and takes screenshots as the web page is loading. So um, this is kind of unscientific, but also it gives you an idea of, of how long your uh, uh, page is taking to render. So um, it's pretty cool, and you can just attach that flag to any of your Fontamas tests, and you get it for free. Um, so the last one I will show you is, I don't remember the number, so I gotta check again. Um, 20, okay, yeah, of course. Uh, assertion, so you can assert different requests, and this just follows any value that you found up here, well, uh, up here. This initial list, so I could change this to this string to test, so you just say assert dash that string right there. <laughs> Um, and so I'm going to say 20 because I know that's lower than the number that it's outputting. And so now when we run this, um, so new test, I cleared my screen. You can see here at the top that um, it failed my assertion that there needs to be 20 or fewer tests on this web page. Um, so this is pretty cool too. And you can uh, have tests built in. Uh, you can have a little script that just runs this command in various formats for several um, you know, iterations, right? But you get this data up front, um, which is great. Um, and so I'd rather know about this, you know, like when I'm committing the code, uh, maybe you added a module and it adds like four CSS or like four JavaScript files or something, and you're like, whoa, what the what? Um, uh, you know, I'd rather know about that sooner than later when you're like trying to fix it. And you're like, oh, how can we get rid of this module? Yeah, that's not gonna happen because it's providing, you know, that pole on the sidebar. Uh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta take those quizzes. Um, so uh, that's basically Fontomas. Uh, this is a, a foundational tool that actually is going to power the next two that I show. So does anybody have any questions about this one, real fast? No. Awesome. Either I'm boring you, or I did a fantastic job. <laughs> so uh, we'll jump back to the slides here. Grunt Fontamas, guess what it does? It does what I just showed you, but it automates it. Um, that wasn't a very good reveal. So Grunt Fontamas doesn't actually just automate it, and I lied. <laughs> uh, so what it does is it basically, instead of just running it for you like PageSpeed does, it doesn't really do anything be besides provide the data to you. Uh, Grunt Fontamas provides detailed <coughs> reports, and it lets you track these uh, the metrics over time. Um, and it generates its own front end to do this. Uh, uh, it's super cool. Um, and the guy that made this is a wizard. Um, and it, it actually even will take multiple runs. So by default, it, it, it will load the web page five times and do these metrics five times and then take an average of those. So you get uh, you know, your min, mean, median, max. Um, and, and so you can see these. And then additionally, that's just one data point on the graph. You can see it as it happens over time. Um, so let me tell you a little story. I can't tell you who this is about, but um, I had a, a client and we were having um, some issues with performance and it was basically my job to tell, uh, I was like, hey guys, uh, this, this was a thing that I was focusing on, it was my role in the project and um, so I was always trying to make sure that everything we were shipping was not increasing the, the size of the, the website. Um, and uh, a lot of times they weren't, um, uh, there was just like difficult conversations that uh, uh, the accountability wasn't there for anyone. Let's just put it that way. And so I said to myself, okay, I'm gonna start graphing this every day. And uh, you can see that, um, you know, we're going along here for a month or two. This, this actually shows a span of about two months. And um, uh, one day I came into work and ran this command and saved the data, just like I always did, uh, except for obviously those big gaps in there, I'm, I don't know what happened. Uh, I came in and, and uh, maybe I drank my coffee and then did this, and uh, so I saw this enormous spike and I was like both horrified and also uh, delighted because I was like, aha, this finally paid off. Um, <laughs> so I was like, danger everyone, uh, we've, uh, we've actually accidentally committed eight megabytes of inline data into our CSS file. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but we can probably go back through the commit logs and figure it out. Um, someone had used the um, inline function of compass, uh, you know, where you can like inline a font or inline an image 
and it base64 encodes it and spits it out into the final CSS. Well, someone did that with like eight megs of images. Um, and so when I ran this test in the morning and loaded the graphs and reviewed them, I was like, whoa, okay, uh, let's go get this fixed. And I took a screenshot of it and sent it out to people and said, this is the deal. Let's look through the, you know, the last 24 hours of commits and figure out, oh, man, let's look through the last 24 hours of commits and uh, see, you know, when this happened. And as you can see, uh, we removed most of them right then. And by the next morning, we were almost back down to exactly where we were. Uh, over the weekend, uh, uh, basically by the time I ran this the next Monday, it was all good. So um, if you didn't have this and you didn't monitor this at least somewhat regularly, you might just be like, man, our site became so slow and I can't remember when it was. I think it was Sprint 7, but like, I just didn't have time to focus on this and you know, look at the web page and figure out what happened. Um, but having a tool like this, um, is really helpful. Uh, I've, I've even talked to our team about um, running this automatically on our own website every day and having like a public uh, display, a public, you know, a wall of shame as, as we, uh, you know, <laughs> do this. Uh, but I'm, I'm joking about the wall of shame, but uh, also it sends an important message, I think, that, you know, if, uh, if our organization is focusing on the performance of our website and we're willing to share the data with you, um, uh, glorious client, uh, we will do the same for you. And we will make sure that your website is performing the same and doing uh, this great job um, and, and, and being the best it can be. So that's, uh, that's why I like this tool so much. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a really good one. Um, and we're also working on, uh, there, I've seen some cool articles go around. Uh, there was one from Amazie Labs that talked about the Elk stack. Uh, so it's Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Um, and so, for instance, Grunt Fontamas just produces JSON. Uh, there's nothing stopping you from putting um, uh, that JSON into this bigger visualization tool and running it alongside all your other logs. So, uh, lots of potential here. Um, in fact, I wish I could show you something that I finished that involved that, but I haven't finished it yet. Um, so uh, this is just the syntax for Fontamas. Um, uh, you can go ahead and run it, uh, uh, but actually I think I've shown you the graph and I've shown you the impact that it has. Uh, that that well, here we can look at a we can look at an example. Um, I forgot what I was doing. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to run it uh, once here. Gonna do its thing. All right, there we go. So it uh, went and downloaded. Uh, it, it actually worked all five times. That's awesome. So uh, it ran the Fontamas uh, configuration that I selected uh, five times, and then it wrote to this JSON file. Uh, and then, because as I said, it generates reports over time, it checked all the other previous JSON files to make sure that they're not going to break D3, um, and then it just saves it out to a static uh, site. So I'm going to open reports index here, and maybe that happened over here. Yep, okay, cool. Uh, so these these graphs look pretty flat, but this is the front end that, that uh, Grunt Fontamas generates. So this is, again, through gruntjs.com, um, and let me scroll down to one that's a little more interesting looking. There you go. Uh, so whenever I did this a few days back when I was demoing to someone else, um, it looks like they had some really gnarly redirect time. Maybe I was on bad Wi-Fi, who knows. Um, and you can see here that whatever they had on the front page is actually smaller now because the dot from uh, May 29th is pretty consistent with the dot from June 4th. Um, and you can see here that, you know, all these graphs are here. Actually, this is vector. It's D3, so I can, like, zoom in and out. Uh, this is pretty cool stuff. So once you get a lot more data, um, you're going to see the data points, and then it, it lists all the raw there for you. Um, you can also suppress any of these categories. If you don't want to see them all, you don't have to. Um, you can just see like three of them. If just three of them were important to you, go for it. Uh, make a smaller report. Um, but that's basically the idea behind um, Grunt Fontamas. Um, how, how many people are familiar with performance budgets? Cool, a couple hands, all right. Um, the idea is pretty simple. Um, uh, just like your monthly expense budget, you'd say like, okay, I've got this much money for groceries, I've got this much money for 
um, you know, my conference uh, drinking or whatever. That's that's <laughs> terrible. That's terrible. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Um, uh, but we need to, uh, you know, keep track of how fat a website gets, right? Um, and uh, you can only do that if you monitor it over time. Like I said in the beginning, this isn't just something you tack on at the end. Um, these are critical decisions that are going to influence how you check that code in the very first time. And there's no going back sometimes, uh, depending on your stakeholders. Uh, so performance budget is a way for them to agree up front, and we can all agree as a team, and the product owner and the stakeholders can all say, okay, we said we wanted a fast site, that was our second priority, and somehow it got moved down to number seven by the time the site launched. Uh, performance budgets are a way of making sure that doesn't happen. You said you wanted a fast site, you're getting a fast site. Um, Grunt Fantomas is working on performance budget features that will record and visualize the fails. So right now it kind of just errors out, um, but if you set assertions in your configuration, um, the way that I envision it would be like that big spike that I showed earlier would be a red dot, you know, and like, uh, a lo you know, highlight that log entry in the raw data. And so you could see, and maybe even uh, if you've got the assertion value, uh, show the line on the graph and say, our CSS can never go above this size, you know, it can never go above, uh, you know, 40 kilobytes or whatever you want to pick. Um, and so then you can see the lead up to that to that goal being broken as well, or not goal, but uh, limit being broken. Um, so performance budgets, I think, are going to be a bigger thing in the next couple years. And uh, the main thing that is uh, stopping them from being wildly popular right now is lack of tools. Um, you need testing tools, and you, more importantly, need visualization tools so you can easily show someone, hey, this is broken. Um, Grunt DevPerf is another one. This was. I, I was so excited when I saw this one, but it was only like six days ago. I was like, man, okay, let me make room in the slides for, here we go. All right, but I got it under control, so you get to see it too. Um, we're going to go to uh, that folder in the examples, and I'm going to run grunt again. Um, so you'll notice that I'm just typing the word grunt over and over again. That means that it's super easy for all of your team to get this set up and, and running, right? So they can all do this. Um, you don't have to type an arcane command in there. You just type grunt. All of the configuration is hidden away from people for the most part in a JSON file for grunt. Um, if you want to use another task manager of your choice, you're totally free to. And I don't even need to name them because you probably know it um, if you want to know it. Um, this one does kind of the same thing. You can see that the Fontamas execution started and then the JSON file was there and there's a couple more data points than, than the previous one. Uh, and then it says, hey, everything worked and I'm gonna go to the reports now and look at this index file. And horsey, no, smiley, yes. Okay, so this looks like a console output but it's actually a web page. Um, and so this one, actually lets you set a, a line. And this one lets you see your goal a little more clearly. Um, like I said, these are all different front ends for uh, the same data on the back because they're both running off of Fontamas. So it's just another way to look at it. And this one actually issues a warning. So in this case, it's saying, hey, there's 16 images without dimensions. If you were looking earlier, you could have seen that in the raw uh, output of Fontamas, but um, you know, you could easily overlook that if you were just scrolling through this big wall of data. So um, this will issue little warnings. So uh, I got to say that Grunt, um, you know, it got a 91 on the page speed, uh, which uh, probably not going to get the first time you run page speed. You're going to see something that uh, is a little lower and kind of like breaks your heart or something. But uh, this is uh, this is just basically another um, way to visualize this data, and and this is showing that GruntJS.com is a very well-built site. Um, it's just static uh, HTML, first of all, but uh, it's got a couple features that are JavaScript, but um, these tools are all agreeing that GruntJS is built very well. That's why I've stuck with the same domain over and over again. Um, so you can see that they are offering some concrete evidence of the performance of the website. Uh, so that, yeah, this, I can close this. All right, cool. Um, so that's Grunt DevPerf. Those two were both built on, um, um, of Fontamas. And there, that's the image without a couple data points. Uh, this last one is built by uh, the guy, uh, Tim Kedlick, who uh, he 
came up with the idea of performance budgets. Um, if you have Smashing Book number four, um, it, is a, it is an entire chapter in Smashing Book number four. Um, I haven't read all of that book, but uh, what I have read was pretty awesome. So um, if you want to uh, uh, pick it up, um, do so. Actually, in the, I live in the city where Smashing Magazine came from. So if you want to visit me, come to Smashing Comp in uh, Freiburg. So, or I should, uh, Freiburg. Uh, sorry. Uh, I gotta, my girlfriend's going to watch this later, so I have to say it correctly. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, Grunt Perf Budget relies on webpagetest.org, which is another tool, completely separate. It does not use Phantom. In fact, it runs on all of the browsers, and it's a very... Uh, it's got a lot of history, and it is a very detailed tool um, that uh, can use IE9, Chrome. It is geo-distributed. You can uh, throttle the network. Uh, you can do all sorts of stuff with it. Um, and so if you're familiar with web page tests, this uses the API, and it basically sets, again, it sets some assertions, runs the data, looks at the data, tells you what exceeded the numbers that you were uh, caring about. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you a quick demo of this. So grunt. So it's running the default. Um, and this is a little different because, like I said, it's hitting the web page test uh, uh, API. Um, and this one takes a second because it's got to go do its thing, and then it's got to report back when it's completely finished. So there is a gap in there. But luckily, I was first in line. And the test is running. Um, and then this is going to come back with some metrics, just some really small ones, because I, I just picked two to, to make it a demo. Uh, so you can see again that um, I picked 1,500, which is actually pretty lax. The numbers that I've been seeing going around are um, 800, 800 to 1,100 is when it starts to become unacceptable. Um, and again, Grunt got a 693, so that's pretty good. Um, and then I intentionally picked 32 so that it's 31 requests that I knew about uh, came back and passed. So you could change these uh, limits for yourself. Um, and there are a lot of um, different metrics that you can look for. Um, I'm just going to pop over here and show you that it does generate a web page test uh, page. It shows you the waterfall that they captured and the film strip and all of the content breakdown and all of that. And uh, Magento, I don't know when I went there, but apparently. Oh, and there's some sponsors, too. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So that's webpagetest.org. Um, I got one more cool thing to show you, and I am running short on time, so I'm going to zip through it. Uh, um, but I'd love to talk about performance budgets with anyone afterwards. Or, if you want, um, uh, the party at uh, Bangers with the... Pantheon and New Relic and, and, and Friends. So we co-sponsor that party. That's where I'll be tonight. Um, the last thing, CSS regression testing. Thank you for hanging in there until 6. This is worth it, I promise. CSS regressions, who's ever heard of that? No one, nothing's <laughs> ever gone wrong with CSS. Uh, so having no scope at all, it's like way easier to screw up than, than anything. You know, you, you put a rule that you thought was only affecting one part of the page and you end up you know, shifting everything to the left all over the place. Um, but this is easier to prevent than you think. Um, the BBC made this tool. It is called Wraith. Uh, what Wraith does is it uses either Phantom or Slimer, again, those two uh, scriptable um, versions of the web browsers, to take screenshots of two environments producing a visual diff of the screenshots. So. Uh, think of your your dev environment versus the trunk environment, right? And you're on a branch, and you're doing your stuff, and your website is there, and then the trunk is there, untouched, before you've merged. And so what you can do is you can run this tool. It'll take screenshots of both of them at multiple viewport sizes, and it'll show you the diff. So their example shows you how everything got nudged a little to the side. And that dark blue... Um, this might actually not be visible on the projector. Yeah, well, the dark blue is there, but basically it's a diff of, of the thing that changed. Um, and so I actually ran this ahead of time because uh, sometimes it's a little finicky, but uh, uh, Wraith is pretty cool. So I'm going to show you the final demo. Time's up, right? Sorry, everyone. Um, okay, so uh, I'm 
going to first show you these two tabs. Uh, can you see the logo moving a little? So if you didn't check that, uh, this, this one is for kitchens.com. This is live right now. This one is just a local instance of the website that I have. Um, and so then when I actually go and look at the, uh, oh, sweet. Uh, it's not big enough. There we go. Uh, so when I go and look at 50%, sure. Um, uh, when I look at these, the first column is the, uh, the production. The second column is the dev, right? And you might not be able to see the difference, but then when you go in here and uh, embiggen one of these images, you can see that my logo is, wow, actually you can't see much except for that diff. But uh, it's kind of grayed out. This projector has a, like a really, it's like blowing out the image, but um, the rest of your website is, is visible there. Um, and so you can see in the context of, of which part of the website was this diff occurring. But I showed you the two logos, right? So you can see that uh, this is the diff that is displaying. And so then this diff is, is showed on the screen. Um, and you can run this thing before you merge your branches. And uh, one, uh, although you might be like, well, yeah, of course, I did some work and I changed how the website looked, right? But you can make sure that nothing else changed. Um, a good example is that we built a website and we like forgot about IE8 for like, you know, seven weeks, whatever. And uh, <laughs> so then, <laughs> We, you know, we, we, like, we were about to launch it, and they were like, oh, we checked this on IE8, and it looks terrible. And I was like, okay. Um, so I went, and I did a bunch of IE8 fixes with SAS and Compass and stuff. Um, but what I did was because uh, I was only making IE8 fixes, I ran Wraith on my two branches to ensure that, in WebKit at least, I was producing a zero-byte diff. So I was able to confirm that nothing changed while I did my other work which is the true value of it, right? You might uh, want to make sure that nothing changed while you refactor some JavaScript code and like change the way that you're, uh, instead of doing dr JavaScript animation, you're using CSS transitions or something like that. So this is a great way to, uh, you know, both verify changes and verify the absence of changes, which I think is, is pretty useful. Um, so I, I know there's probably gonna be a couple questions and I, I can, take them, but I think I got to get through here and, oh yeah, you can put all this into Jenkins and put it into Jenkins. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and also, uh, well, uh, kidding aside, we, we have a blog post that uh, uh, is still alive and kicking from uh, 2011, um, uh, and it goes through every step required to uh, get Jenkins to, to push to your server when you uh, merge on GitHub. Um, and the way it does this is Git hooks, so uh, uh, there's a couple ways, like I showed you things where you wouldn't want the code to ever make it out of your environment, right? So you can use a pre-commit hook to make the test run before you can commit the code. You can use a pre-push hook to run tests before you can open your PR. And you could use uh, another set of tools just to, like uh, uh, pre-merge or post-merge to like go ahead and like run tests on your trunk environment afterwards. So there's lots of opportunities to hook into your version control system and make this happen automatically. Um, there's a bunch of links here if you want to check it out. My favorite one is uh, Grunt for People Who Think Things Like Grunt Are Weird and Hard by Chris Coyer. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, check it out. Um, and these slides are pretty live, so I update them as I see new things. Um, I don't like them being out of date. Uh, so if you see an error or have an idea, file an issue. Um, thanks for coming. Um, please uh, do rate this session. Um, it helps me make better sessions, and it helps... You guys see better content when you come to DrupalCon, so thank you. Um, I got a short link here. It's a j.mp slash aus dash testing. Um, that sounds so simple when I say it out loud. Uh, but you can go to my session page and, and rate it there. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming, and um, I suppose we can take some questions, or you can yeah. just come up here and we can all talk. Um, if you guys want to go, I'm not going to be offended. Uh, be before, before everybody runs off, I've got something really interesting to, to, that you should know about. Uh, it's a tool that we're working on that's combining testing with documentation, and that's turning Selenium tests into walkthrough tutorials. And you, you can record them without using Selenium IDE. You can just record them in the browser, just start a session and click through it. If you're interested in doing that, I've got a beta. It's an open source tool, but we also run a SaaS version of it. If you want a beta invite, just come to me and give me a name card, and I'll, I'll make sure you get a beta invite for that. 
And there's a session about that tomorrow, um, uh, above session at one o'clock. So it's testing and documentation in one. Seven, I think. Yep. Yeah. The answer is yes. How's it going? James, nice to meet you. Yes, I actually, I used Phantom CSS before Wraith. I ended up liking Wraith better. I don't, I don't know, it's just like... Wow, red. Uh, whoop, sorry. Uh, that's awesome. Good tip, thanks. Man. 